I landed a deal. I think my very first big one was around like forty-five thousand uh, dollars Canadian. Whoa! Yeah, that's about um, like someone's typical salary, entry-level salary. Welcome back to Creator Generation. We are joined by Sylvia Jade. Welcome to Creator Generation. Yeah, Fred, nice wave. No one who's listening can see that. It's a beautiful thing to do on a podcast. Hey, to dive right in, Sylvia, like you've been OG YouTuber for a, for a while, but like, what what made you start creating? Like, I love the we love the origin story. So, what's yours? Yeah, absolutely. I I get asked this obviously you know a lot in, in a lot of different places but i think what uh is different from my story is that I, I started off super super long ago back when youtube was really brand new at that point and the most popular videos out there were videos of goats and cats and a lot of animal videos and i just kind of saw it as a, a video sharing website i didn't really understand the concept of a creator and i the the term influencer back then or creator wasn't even that didn't exist at all right Right. Um, so I had seen it as like a video sharing website. I had a friend actually in Australia where you guys are. And um, she had seen a photo that I had on my MySpace at the time. And she said that she really liked my hair. And I thought that what better way to record this video of me doing my hair on my webcam. And I did that, uploaded it on YouTube, thinking that it was just going to be shared with her. I didn't really understand the concept that like a lot of people were, could, could potentially see this. So I sent it to her, um, she was able to recreate my hairstyle. And a few months later, I came back and just logged back on and saw that I had a few thousand views, people commenting for me to create more videos. And it just kind of went off from there. So to me, it really uh, was just an, an, an outlet for me to be able to share are things that I was really passionate about. Does, do people need to know what MySpace is? Or is it just a relic <laughs> of the past? That peop- it's that thing? <laughs> Honestly, if people don't know what MySpace is, then uh, I don't know if they should be watching. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, MySpace is like before Facebook. Do you guys remember having your top nine? And like deciding yes. who your best friends were by yes. placing them in your top nine. That was very fun. Or the hours spent choosing the perfect song. <laughs> yes. MySpace is truly like the first, I mean, not the first of the first, but one of the bigger um, social media platforms where, you know, connected with friends, you could like post stuff on each other's walls. That was really fun. Um, so yeah, that was a, a space where I grew up and I definitely grew up in, in the digital sphere as an internet child. I did everything on the internet. So Sylvia, you work on both sides of the fence. You're a creator, but you also like work on the like you know marketing and brand deal side of things. What what came first? You know, were you a creator first, uploading that first video and playing around on MySpace, or were you sort of already had a toe in the water in the, the marketing and brand space game? Yeah, that's um, I've never really thought of that, but I think they came up pretty similar times. I remember um, at the time when I first started really like uploading on YouTube more regularly. I was in the middle of university and um, taking marketing courses. So that decision came prior to me doing YouTube stuff. So um, I think all my interests kind of like magically aligned a little bit and I just happened to get into marketing and um, happened to be on YouTube. And uh, throughout my life and throughout my entire career, they've always kind of run parallel with each other. I've always been in a space where my career has led me into digital ventures and marketing and things that have to do with content. And um, then the other side, I've always kind of like done my YouTube stuff as well. I think there was a break in time where I was also doing YouTube full time and uh, then like did some consulting for brands on the side. And then, um, yeah, I've always kind of been in and out, I guess. So in a weird way, it's, it's kind of worked together. Do you think it gives you an edge? I definitely think so. Um, just because I understand a little bit more of like the business aspect and what brands are looking for and understanding what their goals ultimately are. And I'm also friends with a lot of different creators as well who don't have a marketing background, who don't have a business background. And they often will ask me a lot of questions about things that in my in, in my mind have come like second nature to me because I, I do have that marketing background. So um, I do feel like it does provide me a little bit of an edge, especially when speaking to brands. I'll be like, hey, like, you know, what are your KPIs that you're looking for? Like, what are the goals you're trying to achieve? Is it like brand awareness? Um, are you looking for more lower funnel stuff? And just like a bit of that marketing jargon that, you know, brands are familiar with, I think does come in handy when speaking to them and trying to get on the same level and um, come to a solution. 
Hey, just a quick interruption. We have the Creator Generation Discord community and it is just for you, the creators of the world, to come hang out, connect, learn and grow together. Hit the link and come and join us. I look forward to seeing you there. All right, let's get back to the pod. Like, Sylvia, you mentioned working, like, going full-time as a creator. Like, what was that experience like coming from, you know, having a... a, a I guess a real job as well as being a creator <laughs> and then going full time. Like what was that journey like? That's like always a fascinating thing, right? Like Phoebe, yeah. you know what it's like. So Yeah, it's very daunting. <laughs> Terrifying. I think, yeah, similar to Phoebe's sentiment. Daunting, terrifying for sure. I think like for me though, it was a little bit more of a natural um flow into it, only because like I had gotten I had gotten into it full time pretty early on in my career, I would say. Like I I was just coming out of school. I did have like a couple of job experiences here and there, it, but it wasn't like I was already in the work field for like four, five, ten years, right? Like I was still relatively new in the workforce. So to me, I was like, you know, if I'm already a student struggling with such a low salary, like what difference does it make to also go into this full time? And at that time I was making a good amount of income as well. So I would say like they were on par. And then um, once I decided to go full time with it, you know, obviously that income just shot up a lot more than what I was doing um, as a, a career, like a regular job. So I don't think that the, um, the switch was as scary only because it came at a time in my life where I wasn't fully invested in my career just yet. Was it a thing? to be a full-time YouTuber then? It, I would say it's relatively new at that time. I remember, um, you know, I, there wasn't tons and tons of people that were like full-time YouTubers unless they were really, really big on YouTube. Um, so I think it was like relatively new and, and some and a concept that people were still nervous about because they didn't fully understand, uh, you know, the, the revenue opportunities that were on there. Um, so I think it was relatively new at that point in time. And uh, now I see a lot more people talking about how, you know, they want to do this full-time and all that kind of stuff. And, and part of me is like, I totally get that. I totally get why you want to do that full-time. But... I also want to normalize people who don't choose to do it full time and enjoy doing it continuously, you know, as, as a dual type of like life or as part of one of the things that they are endeavored. Um, I think the stereotype or not the stereotype, but like the overall con- like end goal for a lot of creators is to, to be able to do this full time, which, you know, if that's not it, like that's totally okay too, because it, takes a different type of person to want to do that like completely full time and a different type of person who's motivated by different things so um i don't think that necessarily that should be like the end goal for every single creator out there yeah i think that's such a powerful sentiment sylvia because there is a lot of pressure and i don't think people understand the burnout that can happen you know especially if you're trying to do both things full time you're working full time and you're trying really hard to make it come across like you're successful in your creation career full time as well. That's a really quick way to burn out. So it's really refreshing to have somebody say, maybe just find what works best for you and don't worry about success just looking like one thing. You don't have to be full time and making millions of dollars to be, you know, quote unquote successful. I won't I won't just do the pod, the little air quotes because no one will see me on the podcast. But um, yeah, you don't just have to do one thing to be successful. Shout them out. Air quote. Yeah. Air quotes, <laughs> successful. And air quotes. <laughs> <laughs> but also, um, you know, a lot of people do aspire to be full time, of course. So, I mean, for you, this is a question I get asked a lot. I'm sure you get asked a lot too. How do you know when it's time to go? full time or it's time to leave your job because there, there is a point where it's a tipping point right I mean they're going to keep going exactly as I am and we're going to keep on like this way or I'm going to go all in and give it a go because that's what I really want what what's your thoughts yeah I think for me when I landed my first very large deal um I was like okay like it's now or never I've I landed a deal I think my very first big one was around like $45,000 uh Canadian. Whoa. I don't know what that translates into uh you know in Australian dollars but for 45k Canadian that's like yeah that's about um like someone's typical salary entry level salary right like some people entry level salary is like 30 to 40k um so at that point when I had gotten that deal I was like okay it's now or never like I've 
made this money and I know that I can sustain myself for at least a year. Um, so that's when I kind of jumped into it and uh, dedicated things more full time and it really shot up and being able to do that full time, um, you know, got my revenue to to double, triple or whatever it may be to really incline. So that's when it was that I found it was the right time for me when I found a opportunity that allowed me to have that space um, to go into that. That's so cool. And just, I know that Sylvia is a person who really values transparency and honesty. Um, we've had some discussions before and that's such a big part of who she is. So just to share something on the other side of the scale, if you're a person listening to that and saying, hey, $45,000, that's that's so far from me. Hey, that wasn't my story and that's okay. You know, for me, it was, I was earning $100 a month from it. And it was $100 that I earned that I was like, oh, you can actually make money from this. And for us, it was just scaling our life down. Um, Matt and I, you know, made a lot of changes to our life. We moved to a cheaper place to rent. Matt had his income. We, you know, cut down all our gym memberships and all this stuff that you really don't need. And we lived a more simple life to make it work for us. So there is no one size fits all. It's just when it's right for you, it's right for you. Yeah, I love that sentiment that you shared, BB, because you're totally right. Like the thing is, there's no perfect formula. Like you really just have to evaluate like, where you're at in life, what you're comfortable with. Like there's no sudden magic number. There's no magic amount of viewers. Like I think um, that's why I always get troubled when when people are like, oh, when when should I do this? It's like, it's really up to, to what you feel yeah. you want to commit to and, and jump off the deep end because uh, the answer is going to be different for, for every single person. Then a lot, like for a lot of people, that income is determined by brand deals like there's a lot of money coming from brand deals like what what's a you know from for both of you but Sylvia to lead off like what's a what's a really great brand deal like what does that look like in your experience like being involved with one what does that feel and look like how do you know this is the one yeah ultimately I mean obviously that longer term commitment is always really nice just so you like know that you're both committed to working together and it feels more like okay we're going to go into this as a partnership and not just like a sponsored ad right like when you have that longer term commitment it feels like an actual partnership that you're going to like meet and think about what the content's going to look like over a span of year what you're trying to achieve over the span of the year how stories can really build up over the year because sometimes with just those one-off ads it's like you know it, it is very sponsored feeling which is fine but when you have the opportunity to need to have a long-term partnership to be able to like have a story that you tell throughout the year that matches certain parts in your life and really like really kind of moves with you that to me is such a beautiful type of partnership um, because you're they're invested in you and you're invested in them um, and being able to make things more organic is um, you know where I strive to be with with my brand partnerships are you are you able to tell us like what like one of those brands that you've worked with and how that sort of came about because I think a lot of creators uh, yeah I'm dying to know I want an example because a lot of creators do get that like they understand like oh (laughs) you know I I want something long term like with it with it but how or what does that look like or but yeah maybe if we can you know dig around in the hood with with one of those ones that you've done that before it sounds sounds magical (laughs) I think that most of them not all of them but most of them did start off with a couple one-offs here and there and then them understanding the value i was bringing them and for me to understand the value they were bringing me and we were both seeing like successes um i would say yeah the best ones probably were ones that originally start off with one-offs and then realizing hey like we actually really enjoy working together your audience really aligns with my audience my audience really aligns with your audience and then building that out and um one of my favorite ones i think was i got to work with garnier which is uh, a hair brand and it was really nostalgic to me because when i was younger as a teenager like i used garnier fructis like that was my shampoo that green bottle was the one i always went to when i went to the store (laughs) so to be able to have this partnership with them was like like little sylvia is like go girl (laughs) you know you did it um and i was able to film this really awesome like commercial with them where they used it across digital um we actually like went into studio like it was a professional shoot i had people like judging my hair and doing my makeup and it was like all the things um that was a really exciting moment for me in my career and um to be able to also be in a magazine like we did a full photo shoot and i was like in magazines all across canada um so but that didn't come just like out of nowhere, right? Like that came because over time we built a relationship. We enjoyed working with each other one off here and there. Not to say that in other cases, I think 
back then it was more like that slow build as like brands got comfortable um, having that larger investment. Nowadays, I do have brands like approach me like for their very first time and are like, hey, we want to do like a year long thing. Um, maybe not the scale of like all the commercials and all the photo shoots, but they want to like partner with me throughout the year, um, which is totally fine. However, I do also approach those with a little bit more caution. Like I, I do let them know like, hey, like we haven't worked together before. Um, I want to understand if I'm going to like your product. Um, so can I try it out first? Um, what are your plans? And that requires a little bit more of an in-depth conversation because I don't want to commit to a brand realizing halfway that like I don't really love what we're doing and then feel crappy about all the content I'm putting out afterwards. Uh, so yeah, I think, I don't know if that provides like more context and uh, different ways that you can kind of get into it. Um, but I say, I would say like, don't be afraid to build that relationship over time with brands. Um, and sometimes it just takes that couple of interactions, those one-off interactions to really get you into a larger partnership. They've got to buy your drink before you then have dinner and then maybe plan a weekend away in, in the cabin, right? Like, yeah. what's... <laughs> do, you, do you think that is the progression of how things should be <laughs> actually work? <laughs> Look, it's been, it, it's, it's been a little while since I've been out in the dating game, but sure, why not? Like, you know, surely it starts with a drink before you decide you're going to sit down and have dinner, right? Like, and, you know, you know but like that's the analogy. It's a, it's a dating game, right? Like, yeah. I was like, I'm like, I don't know. I'm, I'm not one to speak on that. I moved in with my fiance, like, we bought a place together like less than a year. That we right, you went straight to the dating, cabin. It's so fun. For me, I'm like, jump right in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Well, like that's, that's the, the good of it. But what's like, what's the, like, what's the bad of it? Like you, you can't always just have, maybe you do, maybe you've always had great brand deals, but have, has anything ever gone south? Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's not possible for. I mean, I've been together. So, yeah. Okay. Two standout moments. Oh, two standout things happen in my mind. One is when you have to chase a brand for money. Then it's like it's just a crappy experience. And I've had brands that like have not paid me for six months to a year, and I'm like chasing after them. Like I am the debt collection agency for myself. Um, so that's definitely, you know, not a great experience, but one thing that also came to mind, I think one of my biggest, not regrets, but like learning lessons is, um, I signed up to do this year long partnership with a brand and it was a brand that I really liked. However, they were very prescriptive about the way they wanted the content to go about. So like, you know, every single month we would have to have two sponsored videos and, um, each video would have to start. Third, first 30 seconds, I have to mention the brand and we can't mention any other brands. Like they were very, very um, stringent on, on what they were expecting. And, and, you know, at the time I had said yes because it was a large deal. It was a big, big brand. They were like doing big things. Um, and looking back on that, I really sacrificed my authenticity and the connection that I had with my audience for that, which ultimately I think um, led to um, distrust with my audience and I think that that stunted my growth at that time for a little bit because my audience was just seeing like ads on ads on ads every single month and just wasn't really truly interested in my content anymore and I, and I really tried to fit a square into a circle with the content because like they would ask for all these stringent things and it wasn't organic to what I was planning in my content but then I would just make some, make it happen somehow but then that content wasn't authentic to what I would be putting out and I think that my growth suffered um, throughout that partnership. Mm, it, it is a hard one, though, when you think about it, because sometimes these brand deals are super well, lucrative. Um, and Cred is like, well, where is that line? Like, what should I cross in order to do the brand deal, right? Yeah, sometimes, honestly, you just don't know until you don't know, <laughs> until you know, <laughs> unfortunately. But I would say... Um, when you have that gut, like gut feeling, I don't know if you've, if you've ever felt that, like when you have that gut feeling where you're like, like yeah. hearing the terms like going through, you're like, oh, this is going to be a tough one. This is going to be a tough one to get through. That's when usually it is probably not the best fit. And I have to admit, I've, I've pushed through that gut feeling like before and every single time I would say it was not a good partnership um, looking back on it. Um, I was just thinking though, when you said that, Sylvia, I had two, I've been trying to be a bit more firm in my voice because I've been in that place, same as you were saying, that you take things on because, you know, you need the content, you need this, you need that. And I also have this thing where I don't like disappointing people. 
and I don't want to let somebody down. But recently I was like, you know what? You need to back yourself a bit more and you need to say no to things. It doesn't matter how far along they are. If you haven't signed a contract, you can always walk away. And I've done that twice recently and we were very close to going out to filming these two things and I was trying so hard to push it and push it and push it and get it to the place where it was going to be a great episode. And it just wasn't getting there. And I kept saying to Matt, what should we do? What should we do? And he's like, you know what to do. And I had to say no. And um, one person was very, very upset and took it very badly. And the other person was like, hey, I totally get it. I don't think it's good either. So it, it was still hard to do. But in the end, I'm glad I did it. <laughs> and it's okay to stand up for yourself and say, say no to brand deals, even if you're further along than you ideally would like to be when you say no. Yeah, totally. Because I think at the end of the day, like, you know, when you put your content out there, it's not going to do well. Like, you kind of know in your gut when it's not going to do well. Um, so if we can ask a question, like a lot of creators, this issue comes mm -hmm. up that people say, you know, does it fit the channel? Does it fit the audience? And that is important. But there are the also uh, contractual issues, right? Because we're, you know, I'm working with a creator at the moment, and it's a, they're working on this really great deal. But contractually, there are a lot of problematic elements around it. Um, like, you know, they're using old school contracts that don't really fit the space. And if you look at it strictly, it could not be great for the creator long term. What do you think about that? Like, how should they be looking at those contractual terms? Yeah. Oh my God. There's so many flags that I look for in contracts and um, I'm not a lawyer by any means. So don't <laughs> quote me for anything, but the things I look out for are when brands ask for rights in perpetuity, when they ask for unlimited rights that they're willing to like that, you should be able to let them use it in anything worldwide perpetuity. Like all those words are really awful words um, because they just don't fit in this space anymore. Like I totally understand these are contracts perhaps that they used with photography photographers in the past with like, you know, models and photographers that they use to like shoot things for. But um, nowadays, the, that verbiage just doesn't make sense, especially when you're using someone with influence and that has like, you know, likeness to their name, uh, because I cannot be tied, you know, you cannot be using my face forever and ever and ever and ever. Like, obviously, that's going to um, cannibalize my opportunities. And it's just like an unfair usage of someone for an extended period of time without paying them that. So I look out for things that have to do with like perpetuity, um, world, worldwide rights. Um, I look for brands that write in that they can like make you reshoot things all the time. Um, I like to draw the line there. Like you get one free reshoot if I don't uh, show, like if I don't um, fulfill what's in the, in the brief. Um, so if I am fulfilling everything in the brief, then that's, that's kind of on the brand. Like the brand needs to be held accountable too for the work that they're putting in. Um, so that's, that also gets brands to ensure that their brief is like crystal clear and they know what they want because they can't just be changing their mind all the time. Um, when you are having someone invest their, their time and their effort and their money into creating content for you. So there's definitely a lot of key terms that I look out for, and, um, I'm not afraid to call that out. And I always will call that, call that out. And like nine times out of 10, the brands are okay to change that. That's such a good point about calling it out because, you know, I saw on another contract uh, with the creators and they were a little bit, I mean, and arguing about it. This clause was basically saying that you can't compete with, you can't sort of, it's a non-compete clause. So they basically said you can't do anything for our competitors going forward. And looking at this brand, like everyone on the planet is their, is their competitor. They're, such, they're, they're so big. Um, and, you know, the, the creator was weighing it up and saying, oh, should I sign it anyway? And, you know, like, this is a really bad clause to sign. You've got to watch out for these kind of things, right? So there's a lot of, um, some of them are just saying, hey, don't worry about it. Or they just pretty much sign anything. But there should be some more oversight, shouldn't there? Yeah, absolutely. And, and one thing I would say is that don't be afraid to speak up because a lot of the times the people that are sending you this contract aren't the ones making the contract. Like they were get, given it to them by their legal department. They probably don't even know what it says in there. So like, it's okay for you to like speak up because those people probably don't even know what's in there. And um, to that point about the competitor space, honestly, I feel like brands are getting better at understanding this and especially in the beauty space because you know, with beauty, there's so many products. So like, if you're asking me to be, uh, to not work with competitors, like that's a hundred percent of my revenue, right? Like it's just not possible. Um, if you're saying, Hey, like I'm a beauty brand, you can't work with any of my competitors. That's the entire beauty community. Um, so brands are getting a little bit more educated on that. I, and I do take the time to just educate the brand on, on letting them know like, Hey, you know, um, it's just not realistic 
for my audience to even believe that I only use your brand. So I like to use that angle too. So they understand like, I'm just trying to come from an authenticity point of view. So yeah, I'm like, do you really believe that my audience is going to believe that I only use your brand for my entire beauty routine? Like, no, like the, is that how you use your cosmetics? Like absolutely not. Right. So, um, just giving that like more realistic angle and tying it back to that authenticity. I think um, from experience and talking to other creators as well, a lot of the hesitation, no, a lot of the reason why you sign these contracts that have these clauses that you don't really want to do is fear, right? You're afraid of losing the job. Even if it's an unpaid job, you're afraid that you're going to lose the opportunity and what that could bring for you. Um, and that was something I experienced recently. Um, I was negotiating a contract that had some really bad terms in it and I was getting to the point where I was like, oh, you know, we haven't been able to travel in so long. Everything we do is around travel. Maybe I should just sign it. I was right there. And I spoke to a friend of mine who works in PR and he was like, he's like, you are not, you're acting out of fear and you're not acting from a place of leverage. I was like, I have no leverage. They can just pass me over and choose somebody else. And he's like, wrong. This trip is happening and it's happening in a couple of weeks. They do not have time to find somebody else to get them approved by the client, blah, 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 blah. You have more power than you think. So you stick to your guns. You tell them you're not signing it with that stuff in there and they will make it happen. And he was right. And they did. <laughs> so mm -hmm. operating from that place of fear can, can limit you. It can really limit you. And you have to see your value, see your time, all the things you were saying you do Sylvia you know oh gosh it's just so much time that we put into things as creators and we often don't value that hour to hour time that it takes us to do things so don't don't be afraid because you and your time are valuable yeah I, I love the point that you made about um you know oh am I disposable or you know am I can I be easily replaced by someone and I think like okay in some cases like if you are bad to work with then yeah absolutely like there is someone else out there and that is going to take your spot. But if you are generally pleasant to work with, you're right. Like it does take, like the brand takes time to approve the people that they want to work with. And it's not just an easy decision, right? Like, especially when it comes to bigger yeah. brands, they've done so much vetting. They've like gone through the process and they've chosen you specifically for a reason, whether it's for your yes. content that they like, maybe it's your audience that they really are interested in. So just like keeping that in mind, um, I think is important. So I'm glad you brought that up, Phoebe. I wanted to, I want to ask us, like, I think generally, in the broader community of, of everybody in the world, they don't understand how this all happens. And even a lot of creators, they have no idea. Like they're like, I want to work with brands. Why can't I, or how can I? And then a lot of people, as you would have been asked many, many times, both you and Phoebe, plus myself and Fred and everyone else who works in this space, like how do creators make money? They're like, how does this come about? Like how are brands reaching out, interacting with creators? Like, and how are creators finding and getting these opportunities? Yeah, I mean, I am, whenever I get asked this question, I always feel a little bit bad because um, I am guilty of, I don't, I don't really pitch brands that much because I am honestly just lazy and busy to be quite honest with you. Um, so I probably could do a lot more if I actually pitched brands, but I do, I think it depends on your space too. Um, from the creators that other creators that I've spoken to, um, you know, them going out to pitch brands, they may might win like one out of 10. So not as high of a win ratio than it, than the brands incoming to them. I think it also depends like where you are, you know, in your career and, and where you are in your like tra trajectory as being a creator. So again, there's not one right answer. I think that depending on the industry, even depending on your like location, like whether you're in Canada, the US, Australia, whatever it may be, I think the market's a little bit different as well. Um, but for me, mostly it's brands reaching out to me um, and wanting to work on some stuff. Um, I've pitched myself maybe like one or two times on some larger things. So things that had to do with like my wedding, for example, that's coming up. Like I had the opportunity to really capitalize on something that a lot of brands look for that is very difficult to find in other creators. So I would say if you are pitching, Think about like these life moments that brands really want to capture that they have a difficult time looking for. Like it is so hard to just, you can't just go into Instagram and search who is going to get married soon, right? Like that's not something you can do. So being able to take those moments, um, I think is important. Or like if you're pregnant and you like want to work with some brands um, because you're starting a family, I think that's also a life moment that a lot of brands like to capture. So think about like the important life moments that you're moving through that you can kind of pitch as a story. Um, I think that's always, 
is great to lean on rather than just being like, hey, like I do this and, you know, work with him, which is fine, but you'll have more leverage when there's definitely like some sort of milestone that is important um, to brands. Can I ask, mm -hmm. um, we're talking about, you know, creators working with brands that are using terms that might be a bit harder to deal with. Do you really think that, I mean, do you think the brands are trying to take advantage of the creators or they just don't know how to work with them, really? Both. Depends <laughs> on the brand. <laughs> <Yeah>. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I do. I think there are a lot of brands out there taking advantage of creators. Absolutely. They don't, they don't want to pay you, but they want you to work for them and they want to own everything you produce. And they just, for me, that's just a brand that doesn't see the value in what we do. They just don't value that they don't understand that they think that you getting something for free is payment when it's really not um, and then sometimes there are brands who who just don't know and and i try my best when they come to to us just to try and help them understand how things work but even then it doesn't mean that they'll see value in you or what, or what you do it just you, all you can do is help them <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I think um, a large portion of it I do think is like a lack of education. I, I do believe in that. And I think that I always assume positive intent and try to educate the friend that I'm working with, see, you know, what what you know, they're trying to get to. I, I do think the other part, like Phoebe mentioned, is like them not understanding the value. I don't necessarily think it's like them trying to purposely take advantage. I think it's gem them just being like, well, I think this is a fair value trade. Like, don't you think it's a fair value trade? I think it's just them not understanding that value aspect of it. Yeah. I mean, I, when you eventually talk to a lot of the brands, you can kind of see that they're not trying to be unfair. They're just used to working in a particular way. And sometimes even they don't quite know what they need to do to, to make it work. And often when we go back and we're like, you know, we help creators, like, hey, you know, ask about this term and they go and ask about those terms. They're like, oh yeah, I can see where you're coming from. We're happy to change that because it makes sense what you're talking about. And I mean, this new breed of contracts we're seeing as well, um, you know, I've been doing this a, a long while and, you know, 15, 20 years ago, some of those contracts are pretty hef hefty before, as well, well before um, the kind of influences we have now. But I've seen these contracts evolve into some very simplified contracts now. They only go like, you know, one or two pages, but still manage to get the job done, right? Um, yeah. And it's a really interesting transition, mm -hmm. but it's good to see that there are, sort of people pushing that forward and that there are companies that are adjusting to that. Um, and do you feel like more companies are, are thinking about that now? More companies are thinking, hey, we've got to simplify the way we work with creators? For sure. I think that um, a lot of brands or a lot of companies are trying to streamline what that looks like. And that's great. I think that's one aspect of being able to work with creators. And I also think it just depends, again, like on the industry and what you're trying to achieve with creators. Um, I think with YouTube, it is a little bit harder, in my opinion, to work on platforms only because like when I think about my rates when it comes to YouTube, like it's so dependent on so many things. Like it really is dependent on um, what the concept of the video really is, because some videos might take a lot more effort to film than others and a lot more time. Like what some video can some videos can take me one hour to edit. Other videos can take me like five hours to edit. And those are all the things I keep in mind when I'm pricing out a YouTube video. So while platforms I think have been great for me when it comes to like photo content like Instagram content because it's a little bit more transactional in the fact that I have a flat fee for the most part with YouTube because I don't really approach it with a flat fee um, I think the platform aspect is a little bit difficult still so I think brands are or companies are getting there and trying to simplify it but there is still a lot of nuances because at the end of the day it's humans working with humans right like they're it's a brand working with a human brand and there's always going to be some sort of like human negotiation negotiation and human element to it and as, as that obviously progresses you know creators will hopefully find it a bit easier to deal with but they should still look at being smart and they shouldn't feel like they can't say anything because sometimes you know even the brands want them to say something like say tell us what it's going to take to make this work for you right yes exactly and i i can get why it can be intimidating but Honestly, I just think to myself, I'm like, what's the worst they could do? Say no. And then you're just like, okay. And then you go yeah. from there and decide whether you want to continue with it or not. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. So based on that, like, what would you say, well, could you give us some general tips for creators in, in this space, uh, approaching brands? You know, there are some tricky elements to it too. What would you say is, is the best approach to a contract then for a creator? Yeah. I mean, I think read your contract as best as you can. <laughs> 
Um, try to understand. I, I know sometimes <laughs> it's difficult when you aren't in that space. It can be really, really intimidating. Um, but I think, yeah, things to look out for. And if you aren't sure, ask. There are a lot of times that I just full on yeah. will copy and paste part of like a contract and paste it and be like, hey, can you help clarify this for me in just more layman terms so I can understand? So like, that's totally cool too. I, I've done that before. Um, I would say just ask so you know. I know some people believe in like getting a lawyer or a manager to look over it. Cool. If that's what you want to do, that's totally fine. Whatever resources you find work for you. But for the most part, um, I would say don't be afraid to, to speak up if you're unsure about something and don't be afraid to ask um, and cop like literally I'll just like mark up a contract and and add notes or highlight spots and just send it back to them. So do you feel that working on both sides of the fence, one as a creator, but then also working with the brands as well mm -hmm. um, uh, on the agency side, has that made you a better creator, do you think? Yeah, I think, um, you know what, I feel like it's actually made the agency aspect of it better because I bring so much of my creator learnings to that side for sure. I mean, I think if you were to ask the company that I work for, they'd be like, Sylvia has brought so much understanding and uh, advocating for creators. So I almost feel like I'm actually helping that side more and helping in turn, then helping other creators. Um, I help them understand like what rights are appropriate. I help them understand what creators might be feeling or what they might be hesitant about. So like really shaping what that creator economy looks like. Um, I think I've done a lot of work there, which I'm, I'm really happy about. Like, not to toot my own horn, but I, I really stand up for creators a lot, I think, in, in my role on the agency side, and it's something that I am proud of. Um, but yes, on the flip side, uh, definitely I think there are aspects of just seeing more brand interaction on the agency side, then I can kind of understand better what brands are looking for and like what their planning looks like like do they plan quarterly how long far ahead do they plan like those are some things that i kind of keep in the back of my head too when i'm speaking to brands on on the uh creator side and um shout out to sylvia's boss she needs a raise <laughs> <laughs> you tell them. they're definitely listening yeah she does, yeah, she does. Listening. just yeah she knows how to ne negotiate too so look out I honestly wish, you know, it's funny. I feel like I negotiate better as a creator than I do in, in my full-time role. It's like you got two personalities, right? You got, you got your brand side, Sylvia, and then you got your creator side, Sylvia. Yeah, I'm like Hannah Montana. <laughs> well, there you go. Look, uh, on that note, we actually have run out of time <laughs> I don't get the today. reference. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a good way to think about it, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. gosh. Um, well, look, Sylvia, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's been really interesting and it's fascinating hearing about both sides of the fence and, and the things creators should be looking out for. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Hopefully you can come back next time and we can dive a bit more into things like rates and yes. media kits and stuff like that. And I can hear a whole bunch of other awesome tips from you. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you for having me. Yes. I really had a great conversation with you guys and uh, you guys are doing great things. Thanks. Thanks, Sylvia. Create the generation. Look on the mic.